So we're gonna try and do um, a pretty basic talk on Passive House. We're not trying to get into the numbers today because we figured we'd make an introduction to the community, but we have two projects that we're gonna showcase that are local to this area that uh, your project is uh, a retrofit that made the PFIP standard, which is the sort of renovation standard for it. Um, Passive House has five main concepts. And these are insulation, and it seems that my thing is not showing as well as it should, but it really is as twice the code requirements is typical for something that is going to be passive house. Um, windows are typically uh, triple glazed and well insulated. Um, I would say that airtight is probably one of the most important factors in a passive house, where you're taking the time and there's literally a person on site whose job it is to be the passive house uh, air tightness person. Um, ventilation, because we've just made the house so airtight uh, that we want to make it breathable, but we're not bringing in really, really cold air. Uh, we're bringing in, hopefully, uh, using a ventilation system that's about 94% efficient uh, to bring in air that comes in. Maybe it's negative 20 outside, but it comes in at 18 degrees. And then the last one, which is pretty important, is thermal bridges. So that's when the inside and the outside are communicating a little too much and you're getting frost. So we don't want those um, because it's a, you know, you're bypassing all that insulation that you put in and, and making the house not do what it's supposed to do. So the Passive House standard, um, Passive House standard, um, there are two paths to certification, uh, Passive House International and Passive House and FIAS. This is just a screenshot of one of the tools to um, calculate your uh, heating load that you have to get down to. How energy efficient, how low of a heating load do you need to get? So um, I think this is uh, so just looking at it. For this particular standard, you have climate specific criteria, so in North Bay, for those of you who um, in HVAC or who uh, like to do heating load math, um, you would need to build a home with an annual heating demand of less than 9.4 kilo BTU per square foot per year. Um, so not to go into all of the details, but these are tools to come up with what your requirements are so that you can meet the passive house standard. Um, and here we have um, uh, different criteria for, uh, you get credits if there's more people living in your space, so you're not, um, uh, so smaller homes aren't penalized, um, and uh, envelope, if you have a higher envelope to um, floor area, so you have, basically have a smaller house, you get a little bit of extra credit there too, because it's a lot easier to build a well-insulated, very large, empty space um, per square foot than to build a, a small house that has a lot of outdoor surface area compared to interior floor area. So to achieve certification, there's some flexibility of that in recognition of your house is really small, so you worked really hard and, and you didn't really want to get certified anyway. Okay, so why bother? Why the heck are we doing this thing? So I was thinking of this slide as sort of the more, why do I bother is it's for me. I'm a little bit more selfish because I want comfort. I want low energy bills and low cost operation. Um, and I need it to be resilient as we know that the weather is changing and it's been pretty bad up here recently. My renovation that I'm showing later has, the whole reason we did it was because a tornado hit and uh, my, the side of my house liquefied the sand and became a beach. So we want durability and we want resilience. We want good air in quality inside of our homes. So the ventilation system in terms of passive houses, that's what it does. And a long-lasting building, if you're not meeting the dew point or the place where all your good hard work gets soggy because you didn't put enough insulation in, that doesn't happen in a passive house. And you want healthy occupants to avoid the mold and the toxins that we have problems with. So these are the basics of the original passive house concept and why they did it. Cheryl and I are taking our own, adding our own uh, tweak to this. Passive House Standard. The Passive House Standard itself, and Cheryl's going to talk about a little bit more about what that is and how you achieve it. Um, but for us, why a big part of our motivation for building high performance building to the Passive House Standard is because we want to not do more harm than good when we build our houses. We don't want to be 
Uh, we want to be improving the climate, mitigating climate change. We want to uh, help create a more sustainable future for our children um, and the survivability of our species. So um, how do we do that? We discovered that all of meeting the passive house standard is important, but um, we have to, it's essential that we first also look at lowering our body carbon because on day one our houses have an impact and we're using materials and making choices to build our house and if we use materials that have a really high embodied carbon embodied footprint on day one of the of the construction before we've turned on any heating systems before we've used any energy it could be a net zero home but that house could be a climate change nightmare even before the occupants move in so we have to be conscious of our embodied carbon, making better material choices, and also for toxicity. Uh, a lot of materials that are available, people put in their homes, we know have uh, serious health impacts for children in our environment. Um, children are particularly vulnerable to a lot of the chemicals. Um, and then our fuel choices. So depending on whether you use natural gas or electricity um, or wood, uh, that has a different impact for your build. Uh, for a long time, we've been uh, really focused on um, the just the operational time of a, of a building, just this part. Can we get that building energy efficient enough so that if we cover the roof and solar panels, we'll never need electricity from the grid? Um, and not that that is uh, a bad goal to have, uh, but we have to look at the raw materials, the manufacturing, the, lo the logistics of getting those uh, to the site, how they're put together, um, and what happens when the building has its end of life um, and can those materials be recycled or repurposed or, um, or what happens to them. One of the ways to find out, because it isn't always obvious when you're in the, the halls of Home Depot, what um, um, you may be able to go to the grocery store and buy organic food, but you can't just go to Home Depot and say, oh, I'd like the low carbon insulation, please. Where, which aisle is that? Uh, there's no signage, it's not obvious. Um, but it's getting better, there is more data, there's more transparency happening and coming. Um, one of the ways you can find out is by looking up the, in, the environmental product declaration, which uh, there's a couple of different um, certification bodies, so they're third party tested and you can get down and drill down to some of that, that information to make more informed choices. Um, and if you want to talk more about EPDs, talk to Chris and I could afterwards. <laughs> Stick up your hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're kind of getting back to Passive House. We sort of have a carbon segue, and then we're coming back to Passive House, but we're now going to look at it as a path and or a destination. So Passive House is a criteria of rules, specific things that you must meet. Uh, it used to be simple. It used to be 15 kilowatt hours per meter squared. I could say it quickly. 120 kilowatt hours per meter squared per annum for all your power, including all the losses on the house. So that's don't have seven TVs and an air conditioner going, it's not going to meet the standard. And then the other one was an air tightness test of 0.6 air changes per hour. A typical house up here, I would say, is probably 10. Uh, if you're Mine tested at 11. Mine was 14. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a drafty house, and that you're basically, why'd you insulate it? There's no point. Yeah, you're losing 90% of your heat loss. Air infiltration or exfiltration, depending on the season. Insulation filters out some of the dust in the ground. Oh, yeah, it's, it's very good filter. So if you ever pull out the insulation 20 years later, it's lovely color of gray. So, so Passive House, I think of as a path and a destination. You may not always meet the destination, but you may make it on the path there. I always figure there's some houses that will face north. I have clients that have lakes on the north side of their house. So when I build them a Passive House there, that's called a two hair dryer house as opposed to a passive house, which is a one hair dryer house in terms of heating. So I think it's still a pretty good house. So here we're gonna change the passive house a little bit. We're adding our embedded, um, embodied carbon as the first thing of our now list of six things that are the most important. I they, it's, yeah, go ahead. It's not currently part of the criteria. Uh, this year, um, FIAS made it on their wish list of things to incorporate into the criteria. And I think PHI is also doing similar work to try to get more at carbon. So this is coming and will be a part of all kinds of certifications and building standards. So this is, is coming quickly. And um, so it's really uh, exciting and that it's happening, but also uh, important to get in now and, and 
and uh, start working on it. Yeah, so we've got the same five as before, which is the insulation, the windows, the air tightness, the ventilation, and the thermal bridges. This is just a quick recap. Now we have pictures. So of course we chose the opposite size. <laughs> So insulation here, these are the two houses we're talking about, and they're side by side actually. So passive house can be made out of anything. So you've got a choice here. So I'll let uh, Melinda talk about the straw bale at the top. Uh, yeah, so the first section. straw section is simple, really complicated. <laughs> uh, straw bale insulation uh, in the middle and uh, I'll one inch, one and a half inch to two inch lime uh, render plaster um, on both sides or clay plaster or plaster on the interior um, in this particular building. There's also uh, wood structural framing in there periodically. Um, about every three feet in your about, Yeah, three to nine, eight feet depending on what's in between. Um, yeah, yeah. Those and, stuff. and so this is the house next door at the bottom and we'll show pictures so you can see what they actually look like. And this is an original 1985 cottage, homemade, do it yourself. Slightly trapezoidal in shape. And so the interior wall is a two by four construction at 16 inches on center. There's not even any sheathing on the outside. It had two inches of ant-ridden foam insulation. So if I didn't like foam insulation before, I really don't like it now. Um, and so what we did is we took off that foam insulation. We covered it with an air barrier, which is the Mento 1000. And doing the air barrier on the outside in this case was a really easy way to avoid um, difficulties with trying to do an air barrier on the inside. And then we put in uh, two by four strapping on its side to make a rain screen. Usually you do that with one by material, but we decided to add six inches of wood fiber insulation. It's a product called Gutex. And it uh, comes in these tongue and groove sheets that are about 50 pounds. Oh, there's a piece of it over there. <laughs> there you go. Um, and they put that in and then they screwed in through the two by fours into every single two by four stud on the inside. So it's a very, let's so we say it's not coming down in the next tornado. Uh, so some of the material choices, uh, there's a picture of the straw bale insulation um, wall on the left uh, in a window buck and on the right, I don't know if it's bright enough, but that is um, uh, a basement insulated with perlite insulation. Um, under Which is a foamed clay. Just kidding. Yeah. And chosen for... Um, those materials were chosen because they have low body carbon and low toxicity um, and uh, low environmental impacts um, and are readily available and accessible as well. And this is the goose test being cut and then you can see it on the right slide how it's being installed on the building um, outside the uh, Mento 1000 air barrier. And you can see we had to make bucks, uh, plywood bucks around the windows to allow that to be framed in. Then this is a little bit of, <laughs> this is uh, just cellulose as another opportunity. So if you're not doing the straw bale house or uh, you know buying Gutex insulation, I would say that um, we just brought this in as cellulose being one of the low carbon choices that you can make that's readily available to you to make a great house. And then we talk about windows. Um, the picture on the right shows some houses that have double glazed windows or even original single glazed windows. And you can see how the infrared photography picks up the heat changes there, but you know the passive house is the one in the middle where the windows are still blue. So these windows at triple glazed are doing a lot of really good work. And the window shown on the right would be a typical passive house style window with the insulation in the frame. Windows from our projects. Um, and then we get to the uh, airtight thing. So that's showing the Mento uh, 1000 being wrapped around my house. Uh, this is a shot of two um, service cavities in different um, areas of the project uh, next door to that project. This is a two by six um, ceiling uh, and the plywood on top is the air barrier between the ceiling and the trusses, so the trusses actually sit flat on top of the plywood that is airtight. Uh, and so we can run our electrical in here and not have any issues with penetrating our air barrier. And this is the vaulted ceiling where we strapped it with a one by two so we can run, still run electrical up here without um, cutting our air barrier. And here you can see uh, we have used uh, Rissan, uh, which is a Sega tape 
product to tape all the joints to make that plywood airtight. We test during construction as well, have a blower door. We do third-party blower door testing, which you need to do to get your certification. Um, but also we advise and find it really helpful to test during construction so you can test at various phases so before you cover things up and find holes and, and fix them before it becomes a bigger problem to, to get out. And I put this on the side because a lot of people around wood burning, who has a wood burning appliance in their home, it's pretty popular around here. Um, and so to do it in a passive house, you, you can, um, and, but you have to take in some uh, specific considerations. It needs to be an airtight unit and it has to be direct vented with fresh combustible air from the outside through an insulated duct and um, at least one person in the room I know can tell you a lot more about this. Tom sitting at the back if you want to, he's shrinking now, but, <laughs> but so this is actually a European appliance but it is available in, in Muskoka um, so that is possible. Oh, you should also mention it's the boiler for the house. Oh yeah, that also heats the hot water for the house. And the um, reason why it's a European model is the only place I could find one that the heat load was small enough that they wouldn't have to take their clothes off and open all the windows when they lit a fire because the heat load in the house is so small. Um, they needed to be able to put all the heat into the hot water and not sit in front of a blazing fire. So that, that door creates an airtight seal when you close it. This is just an example. This is a house in Toronto. So you get hot air up from the second floor in this building, creating ice dams and the icicles. And the second picture is a few years later after we had done um, a full retrofit with air sealing. And we went from, I think, uh, 11, or 13, 11 or 12 air changes per hour down to 1.5 and have never had an icicle again. Um, this just shows a picture, this is pretty standard in the industry to see this picture of how airtight buildings make your buildings less, more durable and less moisture filled. So uh, the basic idea is if you have bulk transport of water through the, the, the envelope, you're going to cause more problems. So that's just sort of a simple picture and we're running out of time so we'll move on. Yeah, the big problem is, the main thing I think is that even a tiny, tiny leak can cause enormous amounts. amounts of problems and water leakage and condensation. So that's a typical picture of a, a very efficient ventilation system. That's the, um, what is that one called? You have it. Ultimate Air. Thank you. <laughs> the Ultimate Air, um, and it's got uh, a lovely system of bringing in this negative 20 degree uh, air and coming in at 18 degrees. Uh, and it goes, it's fully ducted through the entire house. So instead of being part of the HVAC uh, ducting for a, an air conditioning system, it is a separate system. Uh, so every room in the house gets fresh air 24-7 and it uses very little energy to do that. Keeping your house drier and uh, with a, you know, a filter so it's, it's doing the work instead of your insulation. And this is an explanation which I think is pretty obvious with one picture of what a thermal bridge is. So this is a pretty new building in Chicago. Is it Chicago? I think so. Anyway, I think it's in Chicago. And all of these balconies, if you take the IR photography, are basically a radiator in vertical form. So that just tries to explain to you when you have the inside... Um... <laughs> okay, and then this shows thermal bridging, how it gets avoided. So in a rammed earth house, this is what's showing the insulation goes around the corner. Oh, we got 30 seconds. And the we're just pretty pictures now. So these are this is my cottage before and after, some lovely pictures of it. And now the straw bale house next door. 